my name is David Stops. I was brought up in Princes Risborough. I've lived in Aylesbury all my life since then. Um, uh, I started Friars Aylesbury in 1969 with some friends of mine, including Robin Pike and a few others. And uh, I'm an author, I'm an artist manager, and I do a few other things as well. Can you tell me how, how you got into, into the business of Friars Club? Well, when Robin Pike first came to me and said, why don't we open a club in Aylesbury? I said, oh, I don't think Aylesbury's going to work. I think Wickham, maybe. Yeah, that would be good. But he said, no, I really want to do it in Aylesbury. So I said, oh, OK, well, we'll give it a try and see how we go. And we started at the new Far Ridge Hall in Aylesbury, which is, was in Walton Street. It's demolished now. Um, we've actually had four venues in Aylesbury. That was the very first. It had a capacity of about 400. Uh, we then moved to the Borough Assembly Hall in the Market Square, which was the legendary Friars venue where Bowie played. Uh, that had a capacity of 700. We then went to the Civic Centre, which had a capacity of 1,250. And now we're at the Waterside Theatre, which has a capacity of 1,600. So those are the four venues we've had since 1969, which is when we started. Yes, that's 53 years ago. So you, so you started in Friars and what date? June the 2nd, 1969. And you went on to... Well, we're still running it now. Still running it yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned Bowie. Were there any other big acts that you had there? Were they big acts at the time? Yes, well, they were. We used to have, we used to have a reputation for getting bands just before they broke big, you know because we only had capacities, like I say, 700 or 1250 or whatever it was at the time. Uh, and that's the reputation we had. we had. We were always sort of led by music and not by business or money. Um, as I've got older, I've got a bit better at business, but in those days, it, that was sort of irrelevant. <laughs> it was just like, how, what bands can we get? You know, it was completely driven by music. And because we had our ear to the ground, we knew what was happening perhaps more than other promoters. I'd like to think so anyway. So, you know, we'd book a band sort of for three months ahead, thinking that by then they would have, you know, had a hit <laughs> or a couple of hits maybe. Um, and that often used to happen. Uh, I mean, with Genesis, for example, you know, we paid them £10 the first time, and then £15, and then £25, and then £30, and then £50, and eventually £100. And I remember the, on the night that we paid them £100, Peter Gabriel had me on stage, he brought me out on stage and said, that this man has paid us £100. We've never been paid £100 by anybody ever before. Um, so uh, that, 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 that's sort of a good example. We also were involved with like Cockney Rebel before anybody else, that stands out to me. And Bowie, of course, you know, we went, we put our faith in Bowie when nobody else would, nobody else would touch him. And, uh, but we, you know, we knew about Space Oddity, had already been a hit. Uh, and we thought, we knew he was a good songwriter, but he'd, he'd never really played live very much. So you had Bowie, was there any other major bands that you could mention to us? Yeah, lots, um, but in the punk era particularly, <clears throat> I mean, I was an old hippie basically, still am. And, uh, you know, uh, we were into the sort of, you know, the Genesises and the Camels and the, you know, all those bands, Focus, all those sort of bands which we put on regularly, Can, those sort of people. Um, and then punk came along and it was like somebody's turning everything upside down, you know. And at that point, I thought, do I want to carry on? Because the ethos of punk was very much, you know, <laughs> much more violent, much more exciting. Uh, but uh, I thought, is this for me? Is, can we deal with this? Or shall I just bow out at this point? Because it isn't really, I was peace and love, you know, and, uh, you know, flowers and things. And uh, <laughs> so, but we did, we did do that. And, you know, I remember Elvis Costello's manager, I asked him, say, could, could we have Elvis back again? Because he was really getting very big. He, we put him on once and he then got very big. And he said, you can have Elvis if you shave off your beard and your moustache. <laughs> did you? No. <laughs> and we didn't have him again, which was stupid. I should have done it. If I could go back, I would definitely have said, yep, I'll do that, no problem. 
But I said, no, you can't tell me what, what facial hair to wear, you know. Um, going back to the 70s, just um, how much did it cost to get into the fryers? Not a lot. I mean, the first Bowie gig was 50p, you know, to get in. And I think the second, the first one was September 71. And we had America in support. America turned out to be a really big fan as well. Although they didn't turn up on the night. That's another story. When the second time we had Bowie, it was only about three months later in January 72, we charged 65p. So, you know, I mean, the first one didn't sell out. We, I think we had about 550 people in out of 700. And the second one definitely sold out. So how would that work? Would you rent the place and then pay yes. them and then make the money that's left over with that and that would pay for the artists and obviously a bit of change for yourself yes uh, it was we were a club but we had a moving venue <laughs> we didn't ever own a venue most clubs own their own venue you know like the marquee for example in london but we didn't we rented it every single time which was actually very good to do that because we'd really have gone bust uh, you know if we had our own venue trying to run seven nights a week or something we, we just couldn't have done that. So uh, the way we did it with picking and choosing the bands and picking the dates, we do uh, sometimes four a month, you know, four Saturdays a month or something like that. Um, in fact, in September 2022, just gone, we did four shows at the Waterside, and that's the first time we've done four shows in a month since the 70s. Did the bands have their own equipment or did you have the equipment all set up for them yourself? No, they'd always have their own equipment, including PA. Yeah, so they'd come completely self-contained yeah. uh, in those days. Never had to provide a PA. So you're telling me that David Bowie would turn up in a van with a few of his mates and just yes. get the equipment out and they'd Absolutely. set it up themselves. There'd be no sound man. Oh, there'd be a sound man. Yeah. And they might bring a sound desk. Yeah. And, and they, might, they would bring a sound desk, actually, and they would have their own PA. They were quite modest PAs, though. It wasn't very loud. Yeah. Um, uh, and often distorted to an extent. I mean, if you could go back there now. In fact, someone recorded the very first Bowie gig in September 71, and it's just released. They've, they've tidied it up, the recording, in the studio. You can, there's a hell of a lot you can do in the studio these days to, to make an old, rough recording sound good, and, you know, emphasize the bass and everything else. And actually, in this, I don't know, I'm gonna, hold on, I'm gonna get this book. Um, this came out yesterday which is, um, it's called Divine Symmetry, David Bowie, and it's all about um, Hunky Dory. And the only date we did with Hunky Dory was the September 71 gig, um, which is the day he decided he wanted to go out on the road and, and you know, make, it, make a success of it. Because up to that point, he had um, been writing, he thought he wanted to write for musicals, and uh, he, he'd done a few live gigs which hadn't been very successful, and so he thought that wasn't for him. But the Friars audience was so enthusiastic for him that he did it, and he did, you know, uh, the Stones round, well, Chuck Berry's round and round at the end, uh, and he did the Velvet Underground's Waiting for the Man, and it just went down a complete storm. And he, in the dressing room afterwards, he said to me, he said, well, actually, he said to the band, he said, that this was fantastic tonight, let's go out and do it properly. And that was really a big turning point, that gig, in his career. So that's why it's, you know, a lot of people are interested in it. But, uh, you know, he just, he would just turn up, you know, the lights were just the lights that we had in, you know, the permanent lights we had in the building. I wouldn't bring any lights or anything. Um, in fact, when we had Queen, Moving on a couple of years in 74, uh, Freddie Mercury took one look at the stage and said, we're not doing it, I'm going home. You know, because it wasn't adequate for him. Um, and I remember pleading with him in the Bell Hotel uh, in the Market Square and the band, you know, we had a meeting with him and the band and uh, I said, look, you know, this is sold out, we've sold all the tickets, you, you've really got to do it. You know, you're going to let all these fans down and the whole thing. He still wanted to go home. And then Brian May said, look, I've heard from Ian Hunter of Mop the Hoople that it's a really great place to play. And I think we should do it. And Freddie Mercury said, oh, right then. You know, he's going to go home. Anyway, they did do it. And afterwards he said it was one of the best gigs they'd ever done. So, 
you know, uh, that's another great story. I could, I've got hundreds of stories like this. In fact, I will write the book one day, I promise. I've been, you know, thinking about it for a while. So tell me, you just told me Bowie's played there, the Queen, megastars. What other megastars have you a bit had to play there? Well, and like I say, in the punk period, there was all of them, the Clash particularly, the Jam, um, you know, the Slits, uh, you know, all those punk bands, Susie and the Banshees particularly, um, all those punk bands played Friars. And we were the only venue in the, the home counties that, that would still put on punk because they tried it in St Albans, they tried it in Wickham, and it had gone horribly wrong. There had been violence and damage to the venue and all sorts of things. But we took a lot of care to make sure that people understood that if they did that, there would be no more music. And we used to give out little leaflets to them as they came in, saying, please look after the building, please don't you know, think about violence or, you know, or doing anything, you know, uh, that, that would stop us presenting these shows. And because we took that approach, and I worked with the police as well, I'd phone up the police every week and say, you know, have we got a lively one this Thursday or something like that? You know, I remember with then, like that, you know, madness, we'd put madness on a lot and bad manners and those sort of things, and they were the most difficult ones. You know, and if, we, if I got a message that the Bedford skins were coming, we all start to shake a bit, you know, <laughs> a bit terrified. And I'd tell the police, I said, look, we've heard that the Bedford Skins are coming this week, we'll do our very best to, to, to make it a big success, but you should know. And because I did that with the police, you know, I think they never objected or tried to get us closed down. Um, and that's why we survived, and, and St Albans, Wickham and other venues, Dunstable, didn't. You know, it was, punk was completely banned. Um, and... You were involved in um, David Bowie having a statue in yes. Buckinghamshire. Can you yeah. tell me about that, please? How uh, yes. you started it? Uh, well, in 2016, January 2016, he, he sadly passed away, which nobody was really expecting. And suddenly one day we'd heard that he wasn't with us anymore. Uh, and it was, he was such an important part of the Friars' story. And Aylesbury was very important to him. Uh, I mean, for, for example, on the track Five Years, on the Ziggy Stardust album, he talks about the Market Square. That was Aylesbury Market Square he's talking about there. So I approached the council to see if we could put up a, a statue of Bowie uh, in the Market Square, because he, he, like I said, referenced it in the Ziggy Stardust album. Um, there was a lot of resistance at first, and we had to overcome that, and it took, a, it took a while. We had an event the week after he died in the square, and a lot of people turned up, 2,000 people turned up. We just played Bowie tracks back to back from noon to about 10 o'clock at night. And people signed a petition saying we want a statue, you know, so I was able to present that to the council. So I had to then make sure that it was all right with the Bowie estate, you know, that they would be all right about it. And luckily they said, we're not endorsing anything, but we're not saying no to anything either, which is good enough for me because that means they weren't saying no to it. So we, we could carry on. But it took us two years to raise, raise the money. Uh, we did a Kickstarter campaign with a target of a hundred thousand pounds. And I remember <laughs> The day before it expired, you know, we were at about £55,000, I think. Uh, and I thought, well, it's going to fail. But £55,000 is not bad out of £100,000. That's credible, at least, you know, but, you know, we're going to fail. And then at about five o'clock the day before, it suddenly started to move. And by noon the next day, which is when it expired, we were at 115000 so yeah, and then we had to, got Andrew Sinclair to design and make the statue. Uh, and in the end, it cost about two hundred and something thousand, but we had a lot of donations in addition to the Kickstarter campaign. Can you give me one piece of advice that you could share to inspire others? Yeah, it's all based on enthusiasm, basically. You know, if I have a choice of going with somebody who's offering me more money than the other person, that's not necessarily the person to go with. 
It's who's genuinely got the enthusiasm. And if you follow the enthusiasm, you're usually on a, a safe one. You know, and I would say, whatever you do, um, just give it 100% and be genuinely enthusiastic about it because that's infectious. That infects pe other people around yeah. you. And suddenly people come on board. And with the Bowie statue as a good example of that, where I just kept going. And it was obvious many times that it wasn't going to happen. But I, I, deep inside, I thought, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, I'm going to make this happen. Um, there was an attempt to do one in Brixton, which is where Bowie was born, and that failed because they were far too ambitious and they just didn't raise enough money. But ours succeeded. And, um, you know, that's, that, that's a good thing. I mean, I did a charity thing for stage crew during the COVID lockdown uh, to raise money for Stagehand, which looks after, it's a charity that looks after stage crew. And there was, stage crew were having a terrible time because, you know, they just, suddenly they were working and suddenly they had absolutely nothing because the live events stopped. And I had a, 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 a figure in my head of £50,000, trying to raise £50,000. Uh, and in the end, I got everybody involved. I got Clapton involved. I got, um, you know, Radiohead. I got uh, Billy Bragg. I got all sorts of people. I got, you know, uh, Mark Knopfler. Uh, and we raised just over two and a half million dollars in the end uh, from a target of £50,000. Okay, David, thank you very much for your honest answers and uh, the questions that I've thrown at you. Um, I've got to say, you've done loads with uh, music in your lifetime um, and bringing Bowie to Ellsbury and bringing a statue to Ellsbury and, and helping out the stage crews with, with giving them money. You seem like a real genuine good guy of, of Buckinghamshire and I'd just like to say, you are one of our heroes. Thanks, Thanks, heroes. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure.